you guys. I am waiting to start. Just want to give a little bit of an intro to our topic tonight. I am going to be speaking with Rachel Bayar from the Bayar Group, and we are going to be talking about keeping our kids safe, um, discussing specifically how to keep them safe from sexual abuse. We are going to address the kids speak um, Chaim Walder situation. We got, <laughs> excuse me, I have questions from you guys that we plan to answer. Um, this live will be saved. Um, if there are questions in the comments, I'll try to get to them at the end, but we do have a bunch of questions that you guys sent in that um, we are going to address. I'm just gonna join us. Um, I am really looking forward to this conversation. So, and hey, Rachel. Hey, how are you? Good. Okay. Thank you so much for joining. Okay. So for let's just start by just having you introduce yourself and what you do. Um, sure. And then we'll get to our conversation. Okay, great. So first of all, it's so great to be here with you um, tonight. I know this is a tough topic to talk, to talk about in general. And so it's so great to be able to have this conversation and provide some answers to questions and be a resource. So I'll start with a bit of intro about myself. I'm Rachel Bayer. I'm the founder of a consultancy called The Bayer Group. I'm a former sex crimes and child abuse prosecutor from the Bronx District Attorney's Office, where I was for a number of years. Um, and I transitioned from there to working, to, to working in a global investigative company um, in their sexual misconduct consulting and investigations division, um, where I conducted a lot of historical abuse investigations and investigations into boundary crossing behavior and grooming behavior and things of that sort, as well as conducted trainings and workshops and um, you know, public speaking events on just abuse prevention and creating safe spaces nationwide. So now I get to do that. I work with schools and with summer camps and with faith-based organizations across the country, on what it means to really create safe spaces. Amazing. Okay. And I, I know personally, I've heard from people in schools in, in my area and who have been working in camps who have heard you speak and they say that you are amazing and oh, so knowledgeable and so anyone who's listening who, you know, wants to bring Rachel into their community, I, I highly recommend her. I haven't heard you speak, but in our conversations together, yeah. um, I can only imagine how great you are in a professional setting. And it's actually Thank interesting you. because when we decided that we wanted to do this, this was before any of this kids speak stuff came up with this Chaim Walzer. Um, and so I think the timing of it is actually great because so many people have so many questions and feel so confused and very conflicted. So I think yep. the timing is actually, it worked out um, in the end, because I feel like there are, you know, a lot of questions that people need answers for, and, and you are the perfect person to try and provide them. So before we kind of get into that specific situation, I just wanted to, you know, answer some of the general questions that we got. Um, and I had mentioned earlier that if we get some questions in the comments, if we have time at the end, we can answer them. Um, we want to try to keep this brief, because I'm sure you can't be here all night. And I don't want to be here all night. What do you mean? Um, and I will, <laughs> right? I'm, as much as I'd love to be on Instagram all the time, um, we're not going to do that. And I am going to remember, try to attempt to, I cannot make promises, but I will, my intention is to save this live so that people can watch it. And, and um, you know, if they missed it or, you know, I had a lot of people message me also. I won't, you know, it's Israel, it's the UK. Totally. So I'm going to try to save it so that they can watch this. So I guess let's just start with, what conversations should we be having with our kids in order to attempt to keep them safe? Okay. So I kind of want to take a step back because the answer to that question is a larger, it's a larger answer than what are the two or three things that we can do. And the first thing is we have to acknowledge across the board, no matter where we are, what community we sit in, sexual abuse happens, abuse happens. Right, 91% of kids that are sexually abused are abused by someone they or their family or their community knows. So we're not talking about the notion of this like scary stranger, although that does happen. What we really need to wrap our heads around is the fact that we know this happens. And so if we know this happens, what we have to be able to recognize is that as the adults, it's actually our responsibility to keep our kids safe, which means 
there are things we have to talk to our kids about. There are ways that we can do that without scaring them. And I'm going to list a few of those things in just a moment. But we also have to acknowledge that no matter how many conversations we have with our kids, no matter how many times we talk to them, it's really on us to keep them safe. It's not on them to keep themselves safe. So from the time that your kids are really little, right, babies, before they can even talk, there are ways to actually integrate really good, what I like to call safety tools for your safety toolkit, right? It doesn't mean that that child who has those tools is going to know how to put together like the most intense piece of Ikea furniture, right, of keeping them safe. But it does mean that they're going to have certain tools to be able to rely on and know that you as a parent, as a guardian, are a safe person for them to be able to come to. So we start by, by just acknowledging the names of our body parts, right? I don't know that I can say the names right now on an Instagram live because I'm a little bit concerned that then we might actually be, be dinged in Instagram world. Um, but the correct anatomical <laughs> names for body parts, there's no shame attached to that, right? Like you, you teach your child how to say nose and ears and hair. And the truth is that you need to be able to name the anatomical anatomical body parts just as much for a few reasons. One is if you attach shame to them, then if God forbid something happens in the future, they're going to automatically assume that there's shame attached to that and that they did something wrong or that something is their fault. So we name our body parts. And in addition to naming our body parts and wanting to get rid of shame, one of the other things that we really need to think about is if something does happen to our child, which we hope that it would not. And they come to us and say something like, oh, my tummy hurts, right? And I saw this all the time as a prosecutor where kids would have told their parents something doesn't feel right and something hurts, but what they were really trying to say is that someone touched their private parts. So that's kind of like the first safety tool for your safety toolkit. And as your kids get to be that toddler age, you know, I always liken abuse prevention with kids to the same way we teach them how to cross the street. Right. When I was walking to show with my kids or to anybody joining a synagogue, right? when I was walking to my um, house of worship on Saturdays with my kids, I would hold their hands and I would walk with them and we would stop at the corner and I would say to them, I want you to look both ways and I want you to look to see if there are cars. Are there any cars? Right. And and they would look and I would teach them because I was explaining to them what to do to make sure you could cross the street safely. I wasn't giving them details about what would happen if they got hit by a car, right? Your, your insides are going to splatter all over the ground. Like I wasn't saying that. I wasn't scaring them, but I was showing them with my words and my actions week after week after week how important this was. And so the same way that we focus on body parts, it's important to start categorizing things like safe and unsafe touch from a really early age. And the truth is we do this all the time. When a toddler is like walking around our kitchen and they're about to put their hand on the stove, we're like, wait, stop. You can't do that, right? Like that's not safe. You're going to burn yourself. So if we start categorizing different types of experiences as safe versus unsafe, then it also allows us to broach the conversation of the fact that in certain situations, private parts can be touched. And again, I want to be clear, I'm not using the anatomical names so that we don't get dinged on Instagram Live, but you absolutely should. Um, and you start categorizing it in the way that you think about the world. And then the third thing that you can really do to give a child their tools for a safety toolkit is really differentiate between what are secrets and what are surprises. Um, no healthy adult needs a child to keep a secret for them ever. And secrets are what people who groom children use to silence them. And so you can very easily start differentiating between what is a secret, a secret does not have an ending, and a surprise has an ending. The surprise party is happening on Sunday, it's going to end. We're going to tell people about it. And those three particular things are things that you can start talking about without ever mentioning sexual abuse, without ever mentioning, mentioning pedophiles, or grooming, or scary, scary words. Right. Okay. That's great. My, my next question to you then would be, when is a good time to be having, you know, a lot of the times people think that these conversations are like, okay, I had the conversation, like we're good. 
right? And and I often say this, and, and I know that you agree, these are like ongoing, continuous, frequent conversations to the point where maybe even your kids like roll their eyes sometimes that they're like, okay, we know, body safety, stranger danger, you know, okay, don't let anyone, right? To the point where like sometimes they don't want to hear it anymore. But are there specific times where it's really important to have these reminder conversations? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It's a constant thing. This is not like a get all nervous, sit down at the table, like be sweating and anxious. And like, now we have to have a serious conversation. This is, this is, again, think about it in terms of your safety toolkit, the same way that you deal with going to the beach, let's say in the summer, where you turn to your kids every day that you, let's say, walk onto the beach and say, is the lifeguard here? If the lifeguard's here, we're not, like, then we can go in the water. And if the lifeguard's not here, we're not going into the water. It's constant. It's continuous. But there are moments in kids' lives where it becomes really important to remind them about certain things. And again, not because it's their responsibility to keep them safe but so they understand your commitment to keeping them safe. And that's an important differentiation. So if you mm -hmm. send your kids to camp, right, before they go off to sleepaway camp or even day camp, talking through certain safety values that you have, but also for any kids that are going away to sleepaway camp, hopefully you'll have vetted the camp, their policies, their training, their commitment to answering questions about abuse prevention, right? You should have a knowledge base of where you are sending your kid, but also being able to like point your kid in the direction of resources on the website. Here are four people that are like good safety point people. As far as I can tell, if you don't feel comfortable talking to one of them, there's always gonna be someone else. These are kind of the values that we're sending you with. And sometimes, you know, it can feel really strange to not have your parents there. You know, I had the, the summer before or the time before I sent either of my, any of my kids to sleepaway camp, we would sit down and we would have real conversations reminding them about our safety rules. And the big piece that's really important before you send your kids off, whether again, it's to summer camp or like a weekend retreat, a conference, a Shabbaton, anything of that sort, would also be to remind them that if something does happen, you love them, you will believe them, you trust them, you will not be angry at them, they did not do anything wrong, they did not cause it. And so every time, whether it's with sleepovers or summer camp or any other time that you're kind of giving that extra talk, it is always important to remind your kids, no matter what happens, it's not their fault. Because at its core, part of arming your child's kind of safety toolkit is being able to acknowledge and recognize that just like as an adult going through a traumatic moment, we might freeze or not be able to process or not be able to understand what's happening until after it happens. Why would kids be able to stop it, right? Teaching kids how to say no and push some, someone away Maybe that is helpful because it makes you feel better. But in the moment, that's probably not likely to happen. Hmm. Okay. So what are some things that would put a child at risk of being a victim of sexual abuse? So I think it's, it's hard to categorize, let's say, a type of child because I think that it can happen to any type of child, right? I don't think that there's one particular type of kid. You know, sexual abuse crosses all of these lines that we set in our world, right? Socioeconomic lines, race, religion, right? You know, adherence to certain religious practices. So I, I almost look at it not in terms of the vulnerability of a child, but the vulnerability of a place that we are putting our child, right? Mm -hmm. What have those places done to ensure that they are trying their best to make sure someone who's unsafe or wants to do something bad to a child is not present there. And then giving our kids the language to understand that there are certain unsafe behaviors. Look, is there a chance that, that someone who wants to sexually abuse a child, that if they hear that child saying, well, I can't keep that a secret. Like my mom tells me that secrets are what bad people do. And as my own children have done multiple times to their teachers, like turn to their teachers and be like, and my mom puts people like you in jail. So like, you can't, you know, you can't use the word secret, right? And that has happened like way too many times. Um, you know, 
but if, if someone hears a child speak that way, is it possible that they'll leave that child alone? It's totally possible. It would be, it would be, um, it would, I think it would be off for me to say to you that giving your kids all of these resources means they automatically wouldn't be a potential, you know, victim. I think that that's inaccurate. I think that we have to arm our children with the knowledge, but we also have to arm ourselves. Okay, we have to prepare ourselves for what it means to put our kids in these spaces. Okay. What happens? Okay, so these are like a little bit, you know, heavier questions, but again, these are, you know, important and these are what parents want to know. What happens um, when there is an allegation in the community um, of abuse? What do parents, how should they talk about this in front of their children, um, with their children? So, so I also want to acknowledge that, you know, especially in communities that have a religious lens to them, you know, even though I feel like we're talking about these topics so much more now, right? Like five years ago, we weren't talking about them as much as we are now. The bottom line is it's still really scary and uncomfortable for people who don't deal with this on a regular basis to talk about that to talk about this. And I think mm -hmm. that that has to be acknowledged. And I think that's actually the power of a live like this, which is reminding everyone, actually, you don't have to be a former sex crimes prosecutor to have these conversations with your kids. Um, I think that the biggest thing is to recognize and know that the statistics are, and again, these stats change all the time. Like you could look at different stats in different places, but one in four kids who identify as female who are, girls or one in 13 kids who identify as male, sometimes you see the number is like one in seven or one in six, you are going to be sexually abused by the time they turn 18. Those numbers are staggering, right? Yeah. And so what that means is when you learn about abuse in your community, the way that you talk about it at your holiday table, at your Shabbat table, just like standing in the kitchen because you saw something on Instagram or you read something in the newspaper or like you are sharing a meal with someone, another family, and they come over and they talk about it in just like a, there's no way this happened or it's impossible or like, no way, I don't believe it, right? Or anything that we instinctively want to almost believe because it's so hard to wrap our heads around the idea that someone that we ha may have known or we know of could have done something like this, our kids are listening. They listen to everything. And the truth is that at some point in your life, your child or your child's And if you have been the person that has lamented the fact that there's no way this could have happened or that the person who made the allegation is, you know, is, is so screwed up or like is totally not, not reliable, right? Or not believable, then all of a sudden what you've done is you've, you've planted the seed. Well, well, if they don't believe that person, they're never going to believe me or they're never going to believe me when I come to them about my friend. Or a child is going to remember the conversation that they sat at your holiday or Shabbat table with, right? Where you talked about the fact that the person who's alleging these behaviors must be a liar, right? Must be so screwed up. Like there's no way that they're accurate. And your child is going to internalize that. They're going to have heard that from you. And what that means is that in the future, they are going to be less likely to come to you. Even if you turn to them and you say, but you, I would always believe. Right? Like right. it doesn't work like that. And we plant those seeds and it is so hard for kids to come forward and disclose sexual abuse. Most kids don't. They come forward years later, if at all, decades later. I mean, I, I spent time interviewing people in the course of my work over the past decade who were like 85 years old and had never talked about the abuse that they had experienced because, because they couldn't. Because a child going through this, when it's happening by someone that they know or that their community knows, is thinking to themselves, how could it be that, that this person that has spent time engaging in this friendship with me, who has essentially groomed me, right, has made me feel so special and so amazing, like, how could it be that this awesome person would do something bad to me? Well, maybe, maybe it's my fault, 
right? Or maybe I caused this, or maybe this impacts my sexuality or my gender or my identity, or maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I, maybe I mis misunderstood something, or maybe I'm supposed to do this. Maybe I'm supposed to learn this, or maybe my body had a physiological reaction to the touch that was done to me. And all of a sudden I'm in this position where I'm being told by this powerful person in my own in my own eyes that my body reacted that way because it's something that I wanted so mm. every single thing that we do when it comes to our kids everything every time we we discount someone every time we say that someone has to be a liar or is totally screwed up or something of that sort it plants a seed we have to acknowledge that we are setting the stage for our kids not being able to come forward to us. Right. And, and that's actually something in the conversation that we had prior that really resonated with me so much because I have for sure been guilty of saying that in my own home where I've said, you know, like I, either I've said like, oh my gosh, like I really want to give this person the benefit of the doubt and I hope they didn't do it. And it would be, you know, I really hope that it's not true. Um, I haven't said that someone is crazy, um, but I've definitely said that. And so when you said that, am I cutting out or you're cutting out? No, am I still here? I hear you. Yeah, you're here. Okay. okay. So when you said that, that resonated with me so much because it's so true that that your kids are listening. And, and if they, you know, something that you said was if they feel like they don't want you to be upset at your friend or that teacher or whoever that you want to believe is innocent, they're going to keep it to themselves, right? And if already the statistics are not so great in terms of them coming forward and sharing with you, we definitely don't wanna be doing anything to inhibit them even more or prevent them from speaking up even more. So I think that is like such, everything you're saying is so important, but for me that really resonated with me that I need to be very careful about my language. And so that kind of leads into my next question, which. I'm sure you got a lot and I got a lot is like, should we presume that someone is innocent until proven guilty? Should we assume that they're guilty? And then how do we interact with, let's say it's, you know, your friend who was accused or your beloved teacher or, you know, someone in your community that you're like, you know, I, I can't believe this is true. How do, what are you supposed to believe or how should you interact with that person? And what should your attitude be when allegations like those come out? It's a really heavy question, right? Because there's always going to be some sort of cognitive dissonance. Am I breaking out? Can you, am I breaking up? Can You're you breaking me? up, yeah. yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. There's always going to feel or be some sort of cognitive like dissonance, right? This idea that I can't wrap my head around the fact that somebody is accused of this, right? I don't want to believe it. Nobody wants to believe it, right? Nobody wants to think that this is happening. The, the construct of innocent until proven guilty is a legal construct that belongs in a court of law. And it's really important to make that differentiation. It doesn't mean that you as an adult, as an individual, don't have the right to feel or think however it is that you want to feel or think. But when it comes to child sexual abuse, the idea that it's innocent until proven guilty is what we believe in a court of law. Prosecutors have a heavy burden. We have to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt. That is our check and balance to make sure that we are not abusing the justice system, that we are able to seek justice for people and that we are able to do it in, you know, in a, in, a, in a way that is ethical and, and moral and adheres to the laws of our country, right? That is a legal construct. When we are dealing with an allegation of child sexual abuse, or honestly, the murmurings, right, of child sexual abuse, like the concerns that someone had about the way that someone was interacting with someone, but nobody's come forward and there hasn't been an arrest. The bottom line is, if you are a parent and you have kids, Though you can think and believe whatever you want to think and believe, your first responsibility is to your kids. That's it. Your first responsibility is to ensure that your kids are safe. If you are not 100% sure that the lifeguard that is sitting at the pool is sober 
and safe and watching your kids, you're not letting your kids in that pool. And there have actually been times just using that analogy where I have seen lifeguards at community pools where like, I could tell they're not actually doing their job in the best way possible. And you know what? When my kids would go swimming, I'd be standing there as that lifeguard also. Because we don't put our kids in situations where we say to ourselves, mm, doesn't feel safe, right? When you think about the idea that someone who may have been accused doesn't feel creepy or seem creepy, that's because the majority of people who sexually abuse kids are not creepy. They're not. They're not the scary, creepy person, right? They're not the person that you might see on like the, the episode of like a Law & Order SVU episode. Because I want you to think about it logically. In order to sexually abuse kids, it means that you actually have to have access to kids, which means you have to be good with kids, which means you have to fly under the radar. So the truth is you can let the system work, right? Justice and the police and law enforcement, that is an important piece of this. But at its core, irrespective of what you wanna believe or what you do believe, your responsibility is to your kids and to kids in general. And the bottom line is we know that kids don't come forward and talk about this. And you don't wanna be that parent that sat at that table and said, well, I believe that this person, there's no way this person could have done it. Because if your kid is, God forbid, being sexually abused by someone else, they're going to then interpret that and say to themselves, if I ever came forward and told you, you wouldn't believe me either. So instead, a constructive way is to turn to your children and say, listen, and this applies to, to so many, you know, uh, so many situations that I've seen over the course of a few years. You know, there is information out there about something um, regarding, let's say, a particular, you know, celebrity, an author, a musician, right, whoever it might be, where they have, um, it appears as though they may have engaged in some really unsafe behavior. I want you to know that your safety is my utmost priority. And I love you and care about you more than anything else in the world. I want to share with you and remind you about the conversations that we've had. I want you to know that sometimes it's really hard to see and read and hear these things. But you want to know something? I want you to know that I talk to you about this because your safety is the most important thing. So let's review some of the stuff. Let's talk about tricky behaviors. Let's talk about safe versus unsafe. Right, depending on the age of your child, you may you may use different things. Um, and I have a lot of information out there, especially on Instagram, about talking to different ages, about different types of abuse, um, and a lot of resources out there. Um, but the bottom line is, if you sit there and opine on the idea that you don't believe the allegation of someone, that's what your kid is hearing. Right, right, yeah. And I love that distinction between like understanding that it is the court of laws jurisdiction to kind of, you know, presume innocence until proven guilty. And it is completely different as a parent. Our responsibility is not to take that stance. It's to let our kids know that your safety, like you said, is my priority. And like, let's go over all these things because, you know, we also have to be, we can't be naive to think, well, this couldn't have happened to my kid or this person could never have done it. And just like you said, most sexual abusers don't look like the guy from SVU or whatever. It is your right. neighbor. And that's why so many right. people are shocked, right? And yeah, right. it's this is like that crime of opportunity. Like they put themselves in those positions to be around those kids that are vulnerable and, you know, say the right things. And and when we were speaking, actually, you you gave me like such a, I felt like it was such a strong example of that kid at the play, which I would love for you to tell over again, because it, it really demonstrated to me, like, here are these teeny tiny moments that we might be missing as parents that our kids could be, you know, being, you know, kind of being taken advantage of. And it's being set up that, you know, they could become that victim. And that's why, you know, when you were saying earlier, there's sure. no kid that, like looks like the victim. Sometimes we think it's like, oh, the, the pathetic nerdy kid with no friends, or it could be the confidence. No, I think the, yeah, the kid who's I, on stage in the play and the leading yeah. role. 
I like, and I think I just shared this with you. I think this is what you were referring to. I, yeah. you know, people always talk about the vulnerable kid, right? The kid that is super vulnerable and you just be able to tell which kid, and, and I'm not saying you would, I'm saying this is what people say. You just be able to tell, you know, which kid could be like the victim. And the truth is that that's a myth because people who sexually abuse kids, they might look for that vulnerable child, right? That child who doesn't have the friends to sit with in the cafeteria or, or just seems like they are having a really difficult time navigating things in general. But the truth is that, that people who sexually abuse kids also look for vulnerabilities of, of what I like to call of moments in time. Right. Vulnerabilities in terms of thinking about like a moment where they saw something in a kid that made them exceptionally vulnerable. The kid who and this was, I think, what I had shared with you, the kid who like is so excited about their like solo in the performance or like, you know, standing up in their in their play, just, you know, and they talk about it like nonstop. That is all they talk about and they talk about their parents coming and COVID is, a, is basically, you know, coming to this place where parents can now come to performances and they're so excited and they get up to sing their solo. And then all of a sudden, right, that's the moment that their parent who might be on call, right, or who might be dealing with like a serious situation or not, looks down at their phone, right, is on Instagram, is responding to a text or stands up and takes a call. And whether that kid notices that in that exact moment or not, all of a sudden there's this vulnerability that someone who's watching that situation, an abuser that's watching that, sees like a moment, right? And approaches that child afterwards. You were amazing. You were so great. You were awesome. And I noticed that your parents weren't paying attention, right? Or I noticed that they stepped out and I just want you to know that I was paying attention and I thought you were awesome. I thought you were like, like epic. I thought you were better than anybody else. And a lot of times somebody who's going to try to ingratiate themselves with the kid is not only going to build them up and try to make them feel so special, but is then going to, and this is not every time, this is sometimes, right? This is, this is what happens in a lot of situations, then creates this dynamic, which is what we call grooming, where it's an ingratiation, a breakdown of these natural boundaries, a connection to this kid, where all of a sudden that abuser is then turning to the kid and being like, even though your parents weren't paying attention, I thought you were amazing. In fact, I thought you were the best. Like, don't tell anybody else, right? Like, don't tell anybody else. I don't want to make anybody jealous. I don't, I don't want anyone to think that you're better than everyone, even though you're better than every single other person. So don't mm -hmm. share that with anyone. And uses that moment to then connect with that child. A few days later, it's here, I brought you something special. I'm telling you how amazing it was. I can't stop thinking about it, right? And whether it's candy or gifts or food or time and energy and effort put into what this child is seeing as a friendship, right? Or something special or unique. From that abuser's perspective, it's a breaking down of boundaries that ingratiates that child and connects that child. So all of a sudden, Right? This child is going through this grooming process where they believe that this abuser has their best interest at heart, that they, are, that, they, that they love them, that they think that they're amazing. So you can imagine what rests on the shoulders of a child when all of a sudden that abuser does something sexual to them, touches them, has that child touch them, exposes them to something. And then all of a sudden that child is standing there in that moment thinking to themselves, how could it be? Right? How could it be that someone that loves me or cares about me would actually do this to me. And when we think about the impact of that and how that rests on the shoulders of a child, it's not about knowing that your child would be vulnerable. It's about recognizing that people who abuse kids are really good at finding moments in time. And they're, fi they're really good at finding ways to figure out a way to break down boundaries, which by the way, is why it's so incredibly important that when you send your kid to a camp, when you send your kid to a school, do they have boundary guidelines between the adults and kids? Do they have policies that are really solid and good, right? Are they in a position where they train on those policies effectively and often and not one time and then five years later, like watch a video, right? Like there are elements of this where that's why we focus on the grownups around those kids. I think we got a little bit off topic, but, um, but I see all of that as really answering that question. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. It is answering that question. So then that kind of brings us into now this um, Chaim Walder and Kids Speak. 
right? And I know a lot of people are kind of asking, they understand why Feldheim says we're going to stop publishing his book. And they understand why, you know, Eichler's says we're, we're not putting his books on our shelves. And then they ask like, but should I get rid of the books in my house? And if I do, my kids see me throwing them out. And what do I say? And then even the question of, well, why, you know, why is Eichler's taking those books off the shelves? Why are they taking away his, his parnasa, his income? We don't even know, again, that, that line again, we don't even know if he's guilty yet. Shouldn't, these are just allegations. Shouldn't we, you know, just wait and see what happens in terms of removing books from the shelf, right? I'll tell my kids, oh, he's terrible and, and stay away from him. But do I have to remove his books from my house and from, from the shelf? Why, yeah. why is that an important move in this case? So I actually think that when it comes to, and I hear this a lot, I hear this a lot, especially with regard to other people, whether in the Jewish world or outside of the Jewish world, can't we just separate the art from the right. person, right? Can't we separate what they've created and added? And I think if you're asking my, my personal opinion, you can't. I think you can't. I think the reason why you can't, can't is actually very deep and it's very deep seated. And I think that part of it comes down to really understanding what it means to be the victim of sexual abuse, the survivor of sexual abuse, to know that so many people who sexually abuse kids um, of, of, in every religion, right? So many of those people have things that they have appeared to have added tremendous value in a particular way, whether it's music or in something, you know, academic or whether it's with religiosity and spirituality. And I want, I want people to really think about what it would feel like for someone who has survived the worst moments of their life, potentially that have happened over and over and over again at an age or a time that like, they were just, they were kids, right? To walk into a school, to walk into a house of worship, to walk into your home and see that you are totally fine showing off the art, the music, the books, the works of someone that, again, we know that there will be a court process and there will be, you know, a, a, in, a, in, a, in a legal way, right? There will either be a civil suit or a criminal suit or however it works. But in your home, if someone who's a survivor of sexual abuse walks in and sees that you have no problem utilizing the work, the art, the music of someone that has alleged, has been alleged to have sexually abused, like kids, kids and you feel as though it's totally okay to keep that on your shelf because they didn't do it to your kid right. and the bottom line is you don't really know well what if your kid is walking by your bookshelves every single day knowing that they have yet to share with you the worst moment that's ever happened in their life and they know that they can't because at the end of the day you'll sit there and say well we don't really know how are we supposed to trust you it doesn't mean it's logical right? It doesn't mean that kids speak in logic. They don't. They don't speak in a linear fashion, right? No kid is going to come to you and disclose in a way that completely, that, that is completely clear to you. Kids don't tell their parents or their safe grownups that on Tuesday in July, you know, at 7.15, this bad thing happens to me. They drop breadcrumbs and hints. And if you don't create a space that is open to conversation and acknowledging that we are going to believe kids, we are going to believe victims. We're going to believe alleged victims. The bottom line is you're not creating that space for your kids. And so you can feel and think however you want to feel and think. But your kids come first. They mm. have to come first when it comes to sexual abuse prevention. They just do. And so on some level, having you know, the music playing or having books on the shelf or whatever it might be, it shows when, when you take them down and it doesn't mean you have to rip them up. It doesn't mean you have to burn things. It doesn't mean you have to break the records, right? It means that you could also box them up, box them up and put them somewhere and turn to your kids and explain why. Say to them, for right now, we're boxing this up. For right now, we're not listening to this music anymore. For right now, we're making a change. And the reason why we're making a change is because there are people that have come forward who may have experienced really unsafe behaviors with this person. And I want you to know that when people come forward and share what it is that they experienced, 
we have a responsibility to hear them. And we also have a responsibility for you to know that we believe them. Mm -hmm. And I want you to understand that it doesn't mean that if you learn something that that's bad, it doesn't mean you did anything bad, right? But on some level, I want you to know that this is an issue. And I also want you to know that it's our job to keep you safe. And by the way, I know it's hard. It's hard to do that, right? It's hard to say to your kids, someone may have engaged in really unsafe behaviors. We are going to remove this from our home. We are doing this as a commitment to recognizing that this is a safe space for everyone that walks in. You could have a friend that's had something really unsafe happen to them. And when they walk into your home, just like I want to have the best snack drawers in the entire world, right? And I want to make sure that this home is open to kids and your friends so that they know they can always find food in the fridge and always find delicious snacks like from Costco or whatever it might be. I also want your friends to know that this place is a safe space as well. Right. And, and that is important. So it's not enough to just like get rid of the record or take the books off the shelves. Like you have to talk to your kids about why, and you have to give them space to ask questions. And by the way, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have the answers. Sometimes it's okay to sit with this with your kids and say, I don't have the answers. I just know that it's so important to believe people when they come forward. That's our job right now. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that, and I mean, that kind of answers then the question of why it's problematic to have that like wait and see benefit of the doubt, because again, it comes down to teaching your children that if anything, God forbid happens to them and none of us should take for granted that our children will be safe because we talk to them all the time about these things or because we, we give them the, the safety, you know, the, the toolkit and we, that we have to understand that it is always possible you know, God forbid that our child could be a victim. And so the message needs to be clear and consistent of, I don't give the benefit of the doubt. That's not my job. My job right. is to protect you and Correct. to never assume the best in these cases, to just assume that my role right now is to make sure that you are not put in harm's way and to let you know that if God forbid it did happen, I want you to tell me about it because I'm 100%. not protecting my friend or whoever. I'm protecting you. 100%. Right. And by um, the way, I just want to also add to that, you know, there are so many questions. People love to ask these questions. Well, how do you know if someone's telling the truth or like, what if it's a false allegation? Like I just want everyone. Question. Oh, okay. So, so, so take a step back for a second. I mean, as somebody that, you know, I'm a trained forensic interviewer. When I was a prosecutor, I did a lot of, of child sexual abuse cases and some really, really, really horrific ones. Nobody, Nobody actually wants to go through what they need to go through when it comes to the criminal system, but also in the civil system to have to like identify and, and be so particular about what it is that happened to you. I mean, I had so many cases where we knew that something bad had happened, but we could not prosecute the case because the child couldn't speak about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And there was no evidence. This, this whole notion that, that, you know, we live in like a CSI world. This is what we used to say, right? We live in this world where we expect there's going to be like tons of DNA. There's going to be a DNA everywhere. It's going to be lots of DNA and all of a sudden DNA, which, which on CSI looks so dramatic. Like when you really have DNA that you're actually, you know, utilizing in a case, it's like very scientific and feels a little bit boring almost like, cause you have to go right. through all of the different scientific pieces of it. Not that science is boring. But in a courtroom, it can feel a little bit different. But the bottom line is most of the time in a child sexual abuse case, your evidence is that child and their testimony. That's your evidence. There's no recording. There's no pictures, right? In certain cases there can be, but the majority of them, that's it. And if that child is too traumatized or can't speak about it or can't, can't identify anything, even though you know something horrific happened in the criminal legal system, your hands are tied. Hmm. And when you think about it, the idea of a child, the idea of an adult who experienced a horrific, horrific moment or moments in their lives, having to be torn apart, as most people know that they will be, you know, kids are torn apart on the stand, right? In the grand jury, they have to go through everything that they went through, and then they have to do it again at trial. 
They had to have a forensic interview at a child advocacy center or at something similar, depending on what your jurisdiction is. They had to speak to police officers and psychologists, and they had to speak to, you know, caseworkers, and they had to speak to a DA, right, an ADA like, like me. And, and the bottom line is you could be the best trained in the entire world. It's still traumatic. Sometimes those conversations are happening in the moment, and sometimes they're happening years and years later. So the bottom line is to have to go through what it's actually going to be like if you come forward. And chances are the person that did this to you is someone that no one would ever believe would do this to you. And so you are climbing a mountain and you're climbing a mountain of trauma. And for the most part, the community doesn't support you. That's what it feels like. Right. When we really break it down and think about that, the question of, well, how do you know if they're telling the truth? Who would want to really do that? And when you, get a, when you get someone who's like super sarcastic to respond, well, oh, well, for sure someone who wants money. Like there are a lot of ways to get money. This, to, to tear yourself apart and talk about moments where on some level there's tremendous shame and guilt that, make it, that may, might make it feel for yourself like you let this happen even though you didn't. Dealing with that on the stand in depositions, like it's, it's horrific. It's really horrific. Right. And so that kind of leads me then to my next question of like, what happens when an investigation is done and the allegations are not substantiated? And then let's say it's someone who is in a camp setting or an academic setting, and then they're kind of like brought back into the school. What do we as parents do if we're not comfortable with that do we say well i guess they did an investigation i'm going to trust that they did a good job and maybe they what it was a false allegation right so we use this word investigation in like a lot of different ways and an investigation can mean a lot of different things you can have a law enforcement investigation right something that the fbi does or that your local police department does right in new york it would be you know in the city you're talking about nypd or your you know whatever county you live in right a law enforcement investigation, there are a lot of times where there isn't enough to be able to authorize an arrest, or if there is enough to authorize an arrest, there is not enough, you know, to, to really prosecute or your case falls apart, right? These things take a lot of time. There were plenty of cases that I had where I had to dismiss the charges at a certain point because the person who had been victimized was just done and didn't want to testify anymore, right? Didn't want to have to deal with all of the delays. And so that would happen all the time. It doesn't mean that there wasn't probable cause for an arrest. It doesn't mean that the, that the survivor of this assault or this rape or, or this abuse was, um, was lying. It just meant that at the end of the day, like we have to acknowledge that this is happening to people. And if you don't have someone to testify in a court of law, like you probably don't have a case unless you are the one outlier where there is some sort of video and you have a way to be able to get that in, right? When we talk about fact findings or investigations more in like, let's say the private sector in a situation like that, those, can, those are very different, right? Those are investigations without subpoena power. You don't have the ability to essentially command someone to show up, to speak to you. You don't have the ability to get all the documentary evidence that you might need. And it doesn't mean that that investigation isn't good. It doesn't mean it isn't thorough. It doesn't mean that it isn't done by somebody who has the experience of doing it. As someone that did a lot of investigations in the private sector, um, you know, they are very different than the investigations you do as law enforcement. But I always think that before you accept something blindly, it's important to ask questions, right? If you're in a situation where it's a camp or it's a school or it's a university or it's a synagogue or it's a church, wherever it might be, you go to the people in charge and you say, I need to understand as much as you can tell me what you can tell me and I need to understand what you're doing to keep our kids safe. And sometimes that means an honest conversation. Tell me about the trainings you do. Tell me about your policies. I understand you may not be able to tell me the inner workings, but you should be able to spend enough time with me as a parent in this place for me to be able to feel like I am comfortable with this. And you as a parent, you have to, and I say this to parents all the time when we talk about internet, sa and internet safety with kids. You know, I, I do a lot on internet safety and parents will always, when I'm doing like a live um, in-person session, a lot of times a parent will come over to me and be like, but what am I supposed to do? Like my kid 
has a phone and access to social media. Like, what am I supposed to do? And I, and I turn to them sometimes and I'm like, you're the parent. You get to ask the tough questions and you get to make the tough choices. So I don't think it's that it's a one size fits all, you know, black and white approach, but I think you should be asking questions and I think you should be asking them of the people that can either answer them or the people that are answering them in a way that you decide this is not for me. I'm not okay with this. I'm not comfortable with this. Right. And I guess that would even be true, even if you get an email from the camp or the school or the school or the synagogue or whatever that says, you know, we've done this thorough investigation and we've come to this conclusion, even then you can still follow up and say, I would like some more clarity and answers here. Contact the camp, right? Contact the school, contact the synagogue and say, I, I am confused. I, I need to talk. And by the way, you know, um, I think people always expect that when you ask questions about your child's safety, for some reason, people get really nervous. They think that the response is going to be just like incredibly like, what do you mean? Like, I'm not answering any questions. But a really good leader who actually cares about the safety of kids is going to take the time to answer your questions. And I always say to people, a big red flag is if you get a camp director or a head of school or, you know, a, a, a clergy member who's like, this, this is, I don't have time for this. This is a non-issue. Like you don't need to, you don't need these answers. It's safe. It's fine. Trust me. Like run. Like that's a red flag to me yeah. because I'm putting my child in a place where I am now trusting you will keep them safe. And if you can't answer my child's safety abuse prevention questions, this is not the place for me. It's not the place at all. So I always say like a defensive answer is one you should run away from. An answer where someone says, this is what we do and we're always looking to do things that are even better than like, awesome, embrace that. Work to make your communities safer. Right, yeah, that's such a great point. Our schools should want us to feel like they have our kids' best interest in mind or like you said, our camps, our synagogues. Um, and I think like in this case, you know, sometimes parents feel like, oh, I don't want to be that crazy mom or that crazy dad and I say, like, please embrace the crazy, be that mom or dad who's asking those questions. Totally. Um, yeah. And don't worry about that. Another question that I got um, and that I asked you also in our separate conversation is if there's one accuser, is there always more, you know, cause sometimes we hear, Oh, it, it's only one person. No one else ever came forward. Maybe the case isn't so strong. Maybe it was that one crazy guy with the messed up childhood that made that accusation. If there's one, is there always more? You know, I don't even know that I can answer that question because there always has to be a first one in order for there to be more. And the mm -hmm. bottom line is it's actually the wrong question to ask. And the reason why it's the wrong question to ask is because isn't one enough? Like, isn't just one kid enough? If you have one kid that was sexually abused by someone, you know, who cares? You know, on some level, and I really say that, like, not who cares about that child. Right. You know, right. if you have one child that was sexually abused, isn't that enough to merit the fact that this is a huge issue? That kid's life has been changed for forever. So for you to ask the question, well, not, not you, but I'm saying for people to ask the question of, well, well, if there aren't, you know, 10 people that have come forward, then why should we believe it? Like, is one child's life not sufficient? Like, is one child's life really not enough? Really? And by the way, there always has to be a first. So I can't answer the question of there's always going to be a pattern or there isn't going to be a pattern, but I want everybody who ever thinks about asking that question to really take a step back and like, imagine if God forbid it was your kid. Is that right. kid, that one kid, is that not enough? Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Such a great answer. And, and that's kind of what my response is always is like, one is too many, right? And if it's your child, you're not going to be like, well, I think we need a few more in order to feel like this. Is one is no. too many. Yeah. Um, 100%. Okay. So I want to look at some of the questions that I got here. Um, someone asked, what is the difference between a civil suit and a criminal suit in regards to sexual abuse case? So there are like a variety of differences. Um, and so let me just kind of give a, a very simplistic answer, but I want everybody to understand that there are obviously a lot more nuances and, and it's complicated. And I don't know if there are people actually tuning in from other countries. So being aware of that. Um, here in the United States, we have a criminal system and we have a civil system. 
right? The civil system is very loosely the system where when you sue someone, right? Or when you are holding someone accountable, you hire an attorney, they hire an attorney, and you, you end up, because of a dispute, you end up in a court of law. Um, in the criminal system, there's an arrest right? There's probable cause, but you've reached a level where there's enough to be able to actually authorize an arrest that the police arrest someone. And then the prosecutors and in every state, in every county, you know, there are different prosecutors and um, the system is all very similar, but every state has kind of a different way of, of doing it. You have prosecutors that on behalf of the person that has been victimized, but you're not their attorney, right? On their behalf, essentially, your job is to seek justice because the laws of that state were actually broken or alleged to have been broken by the person that has been arrested. And so on behalf of the state, that's why you see on like law and order, it's like, you know, it would be like Rachel Bayer for the people, right? Or Rachel Bayer for the district attorney's office. Um, so you see that because it's not on behalf of an individual, it's really a prosecution of the person that broke the laws. And in order to prosecute that case, you actually need the person that was victimized, right? Of whether it's a burglary or robbery or rape, right? Whatever it might be to testify because that is part of your evidence. Um, and so the systems are just very different, right? And so you can have somebody that's navigating something that's a civil suit. You can have somebody that's also navigating something in the criminal world. And this is also a very simplistic kind of um, understanding of what the differences are. Obviously there are a lot more nuances as well. Yeah, okay. Um, the other question we have here is, um, how do we address name it, but don't say it in school or at a play date, et cetera? I guess that means like body parts. How do we address name? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Right. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I'm, I'm not sure what that means, actually. Um, yeah. I don't know. Okay. The it, whoever names? sends the question, if you want to clarify, but hold on. Yeah. Um, what questions can I ask the school? Oh, this is a good question. To ensure that there are child abuse safety rules. What are some totally. good questions to ask? So first thing is ask the question and, and I want you to think about when you are getting the response, like, are you getting the runaround? Is there a defensiveness or is there a willingness to sit down and talk to you? Um, and that's kind of like the first piece. Um, and anybody who is not defensive, who wants to talk to you about it, the questions that you wanna ask really stem from what are your policies? What are your abuse prevention policies? And those can vary um, based on you know, what we're talking about, school, camp, et cetera. But every good child protection policy should have an element of what we call boundary guidelines between the adults in the community and the kids and boundaries that can't be crossed. Um, and there should be a policy on mandated reporting on what abuse is on the definitions of abuse. And there should be probably a version of an anti harassment policy right student on student or camper on camper conduct. And then, in addition to the policies, what kind of training do you do. Is it a video right I. I I mean, I love movies, but I don't like video trainings. And part of the reason why is because it doesn't allow for the type of in-depth engagement and also in-depth in terms of utilizing the policies of that school, the culture of that school, the ethos of that school or that camp. You know, I do a lot of trainings at a lot of different schools and camps. And though I always talk about best practices, I also always take into account what that school is and what that community is. I use language and words that make sense, right? I don't train on the boundaries of a Shabbaton when I'm at a school that isn't Jewish, right? So there is an element right. of understanding that it can't be this like one size fits all, check the box video approach. It really needs to be about understanding what age are these kids? What are we doing in this particular school? What are we doing in this camp? And what kind of training do you do? And so, you know, is it a, you did it two years ago, you never have to do it again? Is it a commitment to child safety in general? And I think that when you ask those questions about the policies and the training, you will get a lot from those answers. And by the way, you know what's a really okay answer also? This is what we've done. I think we're not doing enough. I would love to hear what you recommend. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. Wanting collaboration and wanting input from parents. Yeah. Um, okay. Someone asked what kind of boundaries should school ha should schools have? Um, but I feel like you kind of just answered that. Yeah. Unless there is something that you want to add to that? No, I mean, there are a lot of boundaries. There's emotional yeah. and behavioral and physical and there's social media and electronic communication and conversational and one-on-one -on -one boundaries. And I could 
you know, when I, when I do a boundaries training, it's usually about two hours straight. So there are a lot of boundaries that you can talk about in a school. Um, but to mm -hmm. even just acknowledge that those have to exist is a really important piece also. Okay. Yeah. Um, another question is what if a friend or family member is accused of abuse, how to interact with them? That's a hard question. It's a really hard question. Um, I, you know, I think that there has to be obviously a mental health professional involved for you as you are navigating. Um, and I'm not a mental health professional, so I want to be very, very clear. It's really hard to navigate. And I think something that people don't, don't talk a lot about is that when you have someone that has sexually abused someone else, the abuser themselves, they have family, right? They might have their own children or a spouse or a partner or, you know, other people and and the trauma and the ripples of the trauma is, is significant and has like a real ripple effect. That being said, if you have a family member that you know has sexually abused someone, even if that family member is a child in your home, mm. chances are that if you have a child that has sexually abused someone, there that that other person could be your child as well. And mm. it's something that's really, really, really hard to navigate but it has to be dealt with. And I don't mean dealt with in secret, right? The bottom line is that when you have someone that is unsafe to be around kids, you gotta protect the kids. You have to protect them. And that does not mean protect your child that's an abuser. And that does not mean protect your sibling that's an abuser. It means reporting. And it means reporting not to your local rabbinic authority, but reporting to law enforcement. It means acknowledging and recognizing that there are other kids that are not safe around that person. And it also means providing the resources in terms of the mental health piece um, to, to your child that was, that was abused, right? Or that was victimized. And I think that we don't talk enough about what happens in families when that situation is occurring. Um, and, and, and it's not to minimize how incredibly horrific it is. But I also want you to imagine how incredibly horrific it is for the child that had to experience it, right? right? And so that piece has to be the most important. Um, you know, and look, the same type of, of, of weight could be if you find out that it's your parent, right? Or your sibling that has sexually abused someone. And the bottom line is that irrespective of your own personal feelings, your love, your anger, your shame, your embarrassment, all of those pieces, when you have kids in your home, they have to be the priority, which means you cannot say, we'll all get together, but I will watch them like a hawk. I will make sure that they are never out of my eyesight. Like, do you never go to the bathroom? Mm -hmm. Like, realistically, if it's your house and you're hosting, are you really, really? Is that really serious? And so when you think about that, like watching someone is not actually protection, not having them in your home that is protection for your kids. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even that idea of like living that way, meaning that, you know, you don't want to necessarily cut off that friend or that family member. So you're going to have to be on spiel because when the person is in your house, right. I, I don't even know why someone would want to be putting themselves in that position of, I feel so much, it's such a lack of safety and mistrust, but I also don't want to like abandon you. So I'm going to be sacrificing myself. And I feel like this is the ultimate like case of where boundaries really need to be exercised here of like, it's not about like, I don't want to hurt your feelings. It's about my, my child needs to be safe. And so totally. I hope that you'll understand that you're facing these serious allegations and you know, I, I am here for you and I hope that you're cleared and I hope that it's not the truth, but I have to prioritize my kids and I have right. to prioritize my family and I don't want to put them in that position. Um, and and look, I don't even, uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. no, I don't even know if there's anything wrong with even, you know, depending on the situation saying like, I want to believe that you didn't do this, but how can I say a hundred percent that you didn't? Because as much as you know, someone you don't know someone. And by know? the way, there's a difference between thinking that and wanting something not to be. But at the end of the day, I also want you to think about whether your first thought was, I want this not to be true. I want this to not be accurate. Or was your first thought, I want no child to have been hurt. Mm. And when you think about framing it differently, 
that actually changes the course of the conversation. And look, I, I myself know exactly what it's like to be in a situation where you see someone crossing a boundary with your own child, right? Like I, I experienced this once with someone peripheral, not actually in my family, but somebody who is present in a family member's home. And I was really uncomfortable with the boundaries that they exhibited with one of my kids. They tried to give them candy in like a secretive way. They did it in a place where like I was not present. And I actually spoke to them. And I said to them, um, this actually is not okay. I'm not comfortable with this. Please don't do that with my child. If you do it again, you will not be allowed back in this space, right? And, I, and, and again, it wasn't a touching or anything. It was literally like giving candy in a secretive way. Right. But in my family, we don't do secrets and we don't keep things from our parents. You know, and, and I think that for me, okay, I do this for a living and I want to acknowledge the fact my adrenaline was pumping the blood was like rushing to my head. You know, I had um, one of my sisters was present or maybe both of my sisters were present. And I remember turning to them and being like, I can do this or you can do this or we could do this, right? Like I need, there, there needed to be like a pumping up. Yeah. At the, end, at the end of it, recognizing it's really hard to do this. You have to do it anyway. Yeah. You have to do it because we're talking about the safety of kids. So if you need to turn to your, you know, trusted family member, you need to turn to your partner, you need to turn to like your friend and say, I need you to like, I need you to pump me up. This is not okay. I am not okay with these boundaries that you're exhibiting with my child. How could we ever expect a kid to come forward and say, stop, don't do this, right? In arming their safety toolbox. How do we expect a kid to do that if we can't do that on their behalf? We have to be the front line of defense. That's yeah. our role. Right. And it's hard. We got to do it anyway. Hmm. Right. So many valuable points here tonight. I hope that everyone gained as much as I have. You are a fabulous educator yeah, on this you. topic. I wish you didn't have to educate on this topic, <laughs> but sadly you do. And it is so important. And I think these conversations need to continue happening and we need to continue challenging the way that we think about these things. And again, I think so much of like, you know, what we've kind of, um, I don't even know where it's really come from, you know, but these like really unhealthy messages that we've kind of applied in this situation of like benefit of the doubt and, and, you know, innocent until proven guilty. I think tonight, I hope that everybody here understands why those are really not the right responses in situations like these. And there has to be that absolute statement of I'm not going to wait and see. I'm going to focus on protecting my child because like you said, and again, this resonated with me so much, it's not your child's responsibility to keep themselves safe. It is your responsibility and your kids need to know that you are committed to keeping them safe. Um, and it's important, again, you know, innocent until proven guilty, we let the justice system work that out. That is not right. for us to work out. If you are not an attorney, if you are not you know, legal consult for, for these, you know, for the accused, like that's not your place to, to be making those assumptions. And, and again, I think that that was so important, you know, how we started where you were talking about like keeping our kids safe. It's not just like, you know, teaching them like scary stories, like no one should touch you in your private parts. It's naming the private parts, boundaries and consent, telling, you know, sisters and brothers, if your brother said, if your sister says, don't sit so close to her, move over. Right. Right. Very early on. No means no. Stop means stop. She doesn't want you touching her shoulder. She doesn't want you, right? Like it starts early with that stuff. And again, also remembering, and, and again, you said this, and, and I think people know it, but they forget 91%, right? This is a crazy 91% of abuse cases are by people they know. It is the neighbor. It is the friend. It is the family member. It is the teacher. It is the counselor. It is not the creepo on the street. Correct. And it is the friendly charismatic, loving, fun, funny. That's how they get into those situations. That's how they get themselves into, you know, the, the right places so that they can do what they want and, and they can create victims. And I think we need to really remember that and not be naive enough. And again, this resonated with me so much, not be naive enough to think, well, it would never happen to my child because I talk about it with them all the time because this is what I do for a living. I'm an right. educator because I'm a therapist, because I'm, because we nonstop talk about it. Every sleepover, every camp experience, every, every anything, this needs to be that conversation. And I guess just one final question here that we got, well, we got two, but I'm, I'm actually going to touch 
I, I think this is appropriate to ask. People ask, like, what is the, what should they think about sleepovers? Should they rule them out completely? Like, this is the question that I always get all the time. Also, like, should I never send my kid on a sleepover? Right. Like, are they off? Yeah. Often? And I actually have a few posts recently, like in the past month, about navigating sleepover safety because it's a complicated issue. I mean, look, I, I will share with you that in very, 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 very limited circumstances, we're talking about like, someone's in the hospital, you know, and a sleepover needs to happen. Like my kids don't actually do sleepovers until they are um, much, much older. Right. And so like think high school, right. Or, or like the, the eighth grade years. Um, my kids also didn't have smartphones, right. They don't, they don't have smartphones, right. I'm a flip phone person um, until, until kids get older. Um, so, um, you know, I, I actually have, seen and dealt with too many really, really horrific situations of sleepovers to ever feel as though I am comfortable um, or, or my husband and I are comfortable just saying like, we totally do sleepovers. We do them all the time. It's not a big deal. So, so we don't. That was a personal decision that we made. Um, and we talked to our kids about that. It doesn't mean there aren't outlier situations. I really think that though it has to be a personal family decision, it's important to be mindful that when you put your child in a space where they are alone with a family, you have a responsibility to vet in a particular way what, who that family is, what they do, who is staying at that house, what their safety kind of boundaries are. But even more than that, recognizing that most families don't have landlines anymore. A kid can't necessarily just go and pick up a phone and call you. And if something scary or bad or uncomfortable or unsafe happens and they are frozen or traumatized, they are not necessarily going to call you anyway. So one of the things that I recommend, and you can take a look at, at the post that I have recently about sleepover safety is if you are going to do sleepovers, questions that you need to ask the family, conversations you want to have with your kid being able to put them in the best foot forward, make sure you really understand who's gonna be in that house. Um, and I really actually recommend if your child has a cell phone, which is a whole other conversation, um, having some sort of code word that you can text. Something like, you know, good night, silly, right? Or something like that, something that seems a little bit innocuous, something that they can remember. If you get that text or you get that call, no questions asked, you go and pick them up. It might be two in the morning, it might be four in the morning, you won't be angry, you won't be resentful, and your phone will be on all night. But also recognize it's not your child's responsibility to keep them safe. So that means that before you send them over to a sleepover, you have to be able to have a conversation about what your safety boundaries are with that family and then at the same time, recognize that your child should have conversations with you as well. And I think that every family has to make a decision that works for them. The decision that we made is that with the exception of like a few outlier situations, for the most part, we, we actually don't do sleepovers. So hmm. take it as you will. I mean, yeah. I also have a chalkboard in the middle of my kitchen with like safety values, including like no secrets and like chew with your mouth closed and don't send <laughs> nude pictures, you know, all the really good stuff that you right. need to have. You just make it right. part of the regular conversation. So <laughs> I love it. I want to see a picture of that. Um, totally. Yeah. Okay. So this was so fantastic. Thank you so much. I hope that you guys will go and follow Rachel's page. It is so valuable and so important. Um, and again, I hope this is not our last conversation. I hope that we will totally. continue to have these conversations because again, this should just be on repeat, drilled into people's heads. Um, it needs to be something that is always at the forefront that we're always thinking about how to protect. And again, I'm, unfortunately, I'm sure this is not the last time that a com you know a, a situation like Chaim Walder will come up. Um, and we need to really be thinking about these things and thinking about how, you know, reframing our thinking if we've if right. you know for me like I said there were certain things that that we spoke about that were really like so eye-opening for me and by the way I'm I'm in the mental health profession <laughs> like and I talk about sexual abuse prevention and I'm not the expert like you but there were things that you taught me that I was like oh wow like I really need to change the way that I speak and I need to be careful about that and I need to right rethink that. Um, and so there's something to always be learned. And as much as we think we know, you know, like we always learn something new. And I'm sure you're always learning something always. new in, in your experiences. Always. So, okay. Always. So thank you so much thank for this. You. I'm going to try to save it right now. Wish us luck. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Good night.